a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. This week, we have a phenomenal episode for you guys. I got the chance to sit down and speak with Robbie Graham, who is an author, lecturer. He's been all over the world talking about his book, Silver Screen Saucers. He was interviewed by Vanity Fair, as well as he's been on the Coast to Coast AM. Uh, He's just done it all. Uh, Silver Screen Saucers, though, uh, it just details the U.S. government's early involvement in TV and film, as well as their seemingly miraculous change of heart as the clampdown of the UFO phenomena in productions meant for consumption by a public obsessed with the thought of little green men and fantastical flying machines. We also get into the current disclosure movement and where that's going and what to look for there. Uh, It was truly an honor speaking with Robbie. It was one of the most fun interviews I've ever gotten to do. You guys enjoy it, Mr. Robbie Graham. Robbie Graham, we are very excited to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time and I really appreciate you joining us today. How are you, Robbie? I'm pretty good, thanks, Brandon. Good to speak to you. Excellent. It's even my pleasure completely. I've been following your work for quite a while now. Uh, Your book is incredible, which we'll definitely talk about. And I just wanted to see if we could get it going here by uh, telling our audience just a little bit about yourself. Uh, Okay, well, I am a writer and publisher specializing in the anomalistic fields. In 2015, I I uh, wrote my first book, Silver Screen Sources, Sorting Fact from Fantasy in Hollywood UFO Movies, which kind of does what it says on the tin. And then um, two years later, I did an edited volume called UFOs Reframing the Debate, which is a collection of essays trying to look at ufology and uh, the phenomenon itself uh, from a more left field, progressive, um, critical standpoint. And uh I am now spending a lot of my time publishing books by others um, on sort of broader anomalistic fields, including UFOs, but paranormal phenomena as well. And um, so, yeah, that's 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 pretty much occupying most of my time these days. Well, it's a fantastic book. I really appreciate you sending me a copy of it. I've actually got turned on to your work by seeing a couple of YouTube talks that you did um, because you're a lecturer. You lecture all over the place. Uh, And it it was fascinating. I was just enthralled by the amount of research, by the interest and the seriousness in which you took the topic. Plus, you're just highly intelligent. And we need more representatives like you speaking about the phenomena. Keep going. And yeah, no, I, I, I can. Uh, like I said, I've, I've been following your work for a long time. And uh, I just am I kind of fanboyed out here just being able to sit and speak with you about it. But so your, your background is in film. So you actually got a degree in film. Yeah. Um, yeah. My so my first obsession was was UFOs as a teenager and then when I, um, and that sort of lasted until my early twenties when I started to study film at college and then university. And that became my life's obsession at that point. UFOs were put on the back burner and I, yeah, I did, I did a a degree in film, TV and radio studies. And then I went on to do a a master's degree in cinema and, um, half a PhD (laughs) in, um, in UFOs in Hollywood, which ultimately turned into uh, silver screen sources. So you just did finish the PhD because you didn't need to. You're just like, I've got what I need to out of this. And there you go. I actually took a couple of years of audio um, engineering and I just took the audio classes and that was it. I was like, okay, cool. I, I wanted the knowledge, not necessarily the degree. Yeah, I think, I, I, I mean, a PhD is a really tricky thing. I mean, it's, it's, I got into it for the wrong reasons, I think. Uh, really, I mean, looking back, you don't decide to do a PhD unless you want to pursue an academic career, really. And, and I think I decided, or I recognized very clearly a couple of years in that really academia is not something I want to spend my life uh, involved in um, for various reasons. But um, yeah, I mean, I did, I'd, done, I'd done all the work. I'd, I'd done the bulk of the work. I'd passed my viva in front of my 
uh, the lecturers, etc. But it, in the end, it was self-funded as well, and I just couldn't afford to keep doing it. Uh, I'd had to take it part time by that point, so it would have gone on for six years. And I just thought, really, do I do I want to continue to do this? And, I, and by that point, um, the book had started to the, the people had started to talk to me about possibilities of maybe even turning this into a TV show and making a popular book out of it. And I thought, do I want to go down the more popular kind of route or do I want to go down the academic one? I mean, I think in hindsight, I'd have probably stuck it out with the PhD. Uh, but, you know, it is what it is. And it's never too late. You can always go back and do that. And I would love to see something like this done on TV or film or doing something with it in that capacity, of course, with you at the helm. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's th- there's been... We've been, you know, various in discussions with various people over the years about a, a, a an adaptation of Silver Screen Sources or something based on it for TV. And uh, amazingly, at this point, it's still not been made. I mean, there's there's been aspects of UFO documentaries that have looked at the Hollywood angle, but nothing in a in a really focused and serious, uh, rigorous, you know, fashion. And 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 uh, and I think it really lends itself to it. But I think one of the main obstacles to producing a show of that nature is the licensing of TV of the of the movie clips. I mean, it can be very, very expensive to do that. You know, that makes sense. That's the major obstacle that every producer I've spoken to has has, has raised. Mm. Which makes complete sense. But in one in, day, yeah, well, definitely one day, man, you're, you're not done yet. You've got a lot left in you. And I'm, I'm excited to see what you do next. Uh, so you talk a lot in the book um, about the Robertson panel and how that influenced the early part of film and uh, TVs as far as the government's crackdown or censorship uh, as far as steering the narrative uh, as far as UFOs being parceled out in films and TV shows. Do you mind telling us a little bit about why that is? Uh, yeah, I mean, do you want, would you want a sort of a, a little bit of a history of Robertson panel or, or its goal with regard to media? That would be great. I'm not going to say that my audience doesn't know about the Robertson panel. They're, they're, uh, it's a waste of my time, but I would like for you to go over it, please. Sure. Okay, well, <clears throat> um, so of course, by the early 1950s, the UFO phenomenon, the flying saucer phenomenon, uh, I suppose it is more generally uh, understood in the popular consciousness, had reached sort of a fever pitch by 1952 and with the Washington overflights. And then in 1953, a team of um, leading scientists was assembled by the government physicist Howard Percy Robertson for the task of reviewing the Air Force's UFO files. And the Robertson panel concluded that the, you know, the UFOs didn't pose a direct threat to national security, but that the hysteria surrounding them could potentially pose a threat to national security. And therefore they recommended a campaign of debunking and demystifying flying sources in the, in the popular consciousness. And that the best way to do this, uh, mass media, various mass media platforms. And they highlighted a number of, um, uh, a number of organizations uh, within news media and entertainment media who would be good conduits for this message of debunkery. And one of them was was Disney, and I think we, we can talk about that a bit later, and Disney's role in that. Um, but, the, but the official recommendation of the Robertson panel was that the national security agencies take immediate steps to strip unidentified flying objects of the special status that they've been given and the aura of mystery that they have unfortunately acquired. And they recommended that this should be accomplished in their own words by mass media such as television and motion pictures. So... Basically, as of 1953, the CIA started to get its hooks quite deeply and effectively into mass media, news media and entertainment media. It's very well documented now the extent which successfully infiltrated, I mean, American news media across the board by the mid-1950s. It's less well documented the extent to which they actually infiltrated Hollywood as well, although there is some very you know, clear documentation on certain productions showing that the CIA did um, infiltrate and alter uh, the content of all sorts of uh, genre pictures in Hollywood during the time, including you know, comedies, westerns, musicals, all sorts of genre pictures which you would think the CIA would have no interest in, but they wanted to... Yeah, so it's really just about, you know, the, the, the national security agencies, um, the national security apparatus in America trying to manage popular perceptions of hot button domestic and foreign policy issues. And they recognized from an early stage that the best way to manage popular perceptions of any issue really is is through the wielding of 
image combined with narrative. So, you know, you know, so, so, so television and movies, and you can neatly package complex ideas and you can sort of sell them in a certain way that best suits you. And that's what was recognized from a very early stage. And, and certainly by the mid 1950s, the CIA had successfully infiltrated news media and entertainment media in America. And that, and that extended to the UFO issue as well. Absolutely. With Bernays steering the narrative of getting women to smoke. I mean, that was a mm -hmm. big thing. He said, I can, I can make anybody do anything. And it was through that medium. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The, you know, the, the power of the image in, in, uh, well, in human culture, really in the modern world is, is unsurpassed, um, unrivaled. It communicates to us in ways that are really almost magical and, and sort of beyond words. And then when you combine images with, with narrative and with narrative structure, um, you, you've got a winning combination. Yeah, absolutely. It's fascinating how uh, how they're able to do that. Of course, everybody thinks of the the reference of They Live, you know, that John Carpenter's film where uh, mm. he puts on the sunglasses, of course, and it has the most ridiculous fight scene in it ever. But it's a phenomenal movie and it's got a great point to it. Oh, it's a great film. One of the most subversive, probably one of the most subversive films ever made. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there's, there is a, so it's not, it's, I guess they're a rumor. It's not really a rumor. I mean, Keith David, the, the co-star of the movie, said after it was released in uh, 1980, was it eight? Um, that um, that it, it, he, he sort of took note of the fact that when the movie was released, it went to uh, to number one at the box office. Uh, but it was pulled, he said, from from cinemas shortly after its release, despite doing still quite well. I think it had fallen to number four at the box office um, after a couple of weeks. But then it was sort of pulled um, unceremoniously and ahead of when it should have been. And he sort of openly speculated to the press at the time that maybe this is because the movie, you know, people in high places didn't really like the message of the movie. You know, and you can tell a lot about that. What they start to censor is what you want to pay attention to. Uh, you know, the, with these fact checkers and everybody coming up now, and I saw a great thing that said fact checkers didn't exist until the truth started coming out. And it's this interesting thing as far as, and even in um, the early days of the close encounters of the third kind, Steven Spielberg recognized this, didn't he? Yeah. So, I mean, Spielberg, made Close Encounters, uh, started filming that in, in 76. And this was the culmination of Spielberg's lifelong obsession with UFOs that began as a as a teenager, as a child, and went through his teen years. And then he made Close Encounters, the ultimate UFO movie, still the ultimate UFO movie. And he described it as science speculation. Not, And of course, it was based very closely on many real-life UFO encounter reports, as documented, for example, by JLN High. Of course, he took the title of the movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, from Hynek's classification system. And of course, Hynek then has a, has a cameo in the movie as well. Well, Spielberg uh, wanted to have the assistance of the U.S. Air Force uh, in the movie. He requested the assistance of the U.S. Air Force in order to cut production costs. Typically, filmmakers will approach the Air Force or various branches of the U.S. military in order to have their hardware and troops on screen if the script calls for it, in order to avoid using special effects that would have to recreate those images and typically the military will in or they will accept on the condition that they have some say in the content of of the movie uh, and then it, and then it becomes and then you enter into an official contractual relationship with the department of defense and then of course you're into the realms of sort of propaganda so but spielberg at this point he wanted to secure the assistance of the US Air Force for some of the scenes in the movie because the script called for it. But the Air Force were very concerned about the nature of the movie at that point. Um, film would be so powerful. Bear in mind, Spielberg was at that point, uh, you know, the, the hot new director in Hollywood. He'd just made Jaws, which is, had rapidly become the most successful film of all time two years earlier. And, um, you know, this guy at the helm of a UFO movie, they were worried that this was going to cause mass hysteria and was going to send certain messages to the to the public, which perhaps were undesirable for the Air Force. And so the Air Force, they declined his request and we, we, we will not um, support the movie because it, it's in contravention of our policy the years um, 
actually beginning with Project Blue Book, the closure of Project Blue Book in 1969, where the Air Force, Air Force stated that they had no continuing interest in the subject and that there was no evidence that UFOs posed any, you know, or, or represented any anything beyond uh, human intelligence or technology. And that's the position that they'd maintained and were maintaining at that point. And therefore, to support the movie, a pro-UFO movie, they felt that this, that this would actually give the impression that the Air Force was, you know, pro-UFO. So they declined. But also Spielberg sought the um, the cooperation of NASA for the same reasons. And Spielberg actually would say in an interview a couple of years later that um, he was declined by NASA, and he actually received a twenty page a twenty page letter from NASA explaining to him that uh, that they thought that the film would cause you know huge hysteria and lots and lots of UFO sightings and overwhelm, you know, the national security apparatus with, with UFO reports. And so they were very, and Spielberg, you know, made a, made a note of this and sort of thought, well, they clearly are quite interested and quite concerned about the phenomenon if they took the time to write me a 20 page letter. Exactly. And it's that it's, it's looking at the denial or the over interest because when there a gentleman, uh, you pointed out in one of your talks i don't mean to put you on the spot about his name but um he uh had a film that he was putting out and he told the public that once the movie was to be released he had a actual ufo landing and taking off and doing maneuvers a video of this or a film of this that he would release that was locked up in a bank vault um and that was a good pr stunt for the movie and of course it turned out not to be true but the the pentagon really took interest in this ah yeah so that was uh, the very first flying saucer movie really which was 1950 so this was three years after the kenneth arnold sighting that triggered the ufo era the roswell incident this was three years later this is 1950 and this was a movie called the flying saucer directed by a canadian guy called michael conrad and it was a really low budget very boring uneventful movie with a flying saucer that looked sort of like a, a plane it had a cockpit but it was basically a flying saucer and it was really just to cash in on the on the flying saucer craze at the time but for publicity purposes during the production conrad had claimed public to the media that he had real footage of ufos that he was going to use that he'd filmed and that he was going to use in the movie and no one would see it until the movie was released this got the attention of the air force who were obviously actively investigating at that point. And they actually had some of their representatives go and attend the first uh, screening of the movie in order to see what all the fuss was about. And uh, of course, there was nothing to it. Conrad didn't have any real footage, but they did uh, question him about it and they were very concerned. And obviously they, 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 they thought it was real enough. You know, they obviously considered the phenomenon real enough at that point to go and see the movie in case he really did have UFO footage. Right, and their interest is what's so interesting about it. Yeah, I mean, of course, now, you know, in 2021, it all makes sense. We know for a fact now, we've known for many years that the US, that the US Air Force and, and government more broadly has um, has been deeply interested in UFOs right from 19, well, even before 1947. Um, and we know that now, especially post post uh, 2017, now that the Pentagon has officially acknowledged that, that it's actively studying UFOs. There's document. I mean, literally tens, maybe even hundreds, hundreds of thousands of pages of UFO documentation has been declassified over the years from every branch of the U.S. government and military, showing a clear, very serious interest in UFOs and related phenomena going way back to the mid to late 1940s. Yeah, it, it's interesting. And yeah, it is interesting that all these things are coming out here. Uh, I do want to talk to you a little bit about what you think disclosure is um like what's going on right now with that in your mind? What do you think the whole disclosure movement's all about? Do you think it's smokescreen? Do you think it's legit? Do you think that finally the ideals of the Robertson panels have faded and have said, well, it's about time. We don't think that uh, they're that big of a deal anymore. We think that the public is more mentally capable of handling it. It's a very, very complicated question, a very complex question, a very complicated answer. And in short, I don't know. I really, and it's something that I give a great deal of thought to. I mean, it occupies a lot of my thoughts and it has done for years. And I, and I honestly couldn't tell you, I mean, I could only give you anyone who tells you, anyone who, who does tell you that they know 
is a bullshitter. Of course. Anybody who says yeah, this is the way it is, it's most likely not that. And especially in the UFO community, the, you've got the nuts and bolts people, you've got the interdimensional people. And this is what Philip Mantle and I were speaking about. I uh, was planting your flag somewhere. And I think that even with uh, Jalen Honig, they're, they're his end days, as well as um, Jacques Vallée, I mean, they, they don't plant their flag anywhere. They know that if you look deeply into this, that it's all connected and that we have no idea. Yeah. Um, so I think I'm back a little bit on that one because I think you, you could you re, could you ask me that question again? Just so that because I want to go back to the 1950s on it a I minute. Mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. I actually uh, we can continue to talk about your book and your work. I actually just jumped in with a question. I had. No, I mean, there. no, I mean, I know. I mean, literally, I mean, I can talk about it now, but I wanted to sort of address it through the past and bring it up to present because it won't make sense otherwise. Absolutely. Make any sense. So it seems like these days, just from an outsider looking in, if you've been following the phenomenon at all, um, that it looks like that nowadays with the Pentagon releasing the information that they did with the Nimitz crisis, Craft, um, coming out, the mm -hmm. tic-tac, you know, um, then back in the 50s, of course, they were trying to negate public hysteria. So do you feel that right. perhaps that the reason that they're letting us know now or they're releasing these documents now is that they feel that that's not as big of an issue? Okay. So one of the key things I've always focused on is the concept of perception management. It's one of the key themes of all of the work that I've done since, really. This isn't a term that I've coined. This has been used for many, many years, perception management. Now, <clears throat> the Robertson panel in 1953 recommended that the phenomenon should be debunked and demystified. They wanted it to be completely ridiculed, and they were very successful in doing that. In fact, the, the ridicule factor surrounding UFOs, which still exists today, but which is rapidly sort of diminishing, um, <clears throat> was really in large part due to the success of the Robertson panel. Uh, UFOs and people who saw them were made to seem completely ridiculous and mad. And that was due to the success of, of, the, of that campaign and UFOs being consistently represented as, as, some, as something that should be ignored or laughed at that didn't exist, that weren't real. However, I strongly contend that not too long after those recommendations were made, maybe a decade later, maybe a bit longer than that, the, the agencies started to recognize that the phenomenon was not going anywhere. You can do all you want to debunk and demystify it, but as long as people continue to see it and experience it, and as long as it continues to manifest itself around the world, people continue to photograph and film it. People from all walks of life are experiencing it and seeing it. You can't successfully in the long term convince people that it doesn't exist. You just can't. But what you can do, which they will have recognized, is that you can manage how people perceive it. And you can manage how people perceive your, i.e. their, the government's relationship to it. And so, so, that's, so it became less about debunking and demystifying and ridiculing and more about subtly sort of engaging with, engaging with the subculture, with ufology, and trying to manage how the phenomenon is being interpreted and received at a subcultural level through ufology, and then in turn through pop culture, because the subculture always feeds into the pop culture. So subculture, the subculture has laid the foundations for many of the most successful and popular uh, iconic movies and TV shows on this subject, the X-Files, Independence Day, you know, all of these films have references to ufology and, and take many of their ideas from, from the UFO literature. And so, so you can, it's sort of a, a long process. Also, you know, the, the, the people behind the scenes who's, who, who have studied this, the men in black, shall we call them, uh, for lack of a better word, the, sec the, the secret keepers, um, they will have recognized as well that the phenomenon didn't just begin in 1947, that it's been with us for a very long time. You know, this is starting, Jacques Vallée has documented this. It's been in historical records in different guises for millennia uh, and probably predates recorded history even. So, so if, it, if it's been with us for this long, chances are it's going to be with us for a great deal longer. And therefore, you can afford to play a longer game, you know. So, you, so it's not about convincing people that it doesn't exist. It's about managing how people perceive it.
in a way that best serves you and your own agendas, whatever they might be. And we can only speculate about those, but agendas will relate to national security and in relation to potential foreign enemies as well. And how this phenomenon might be exploited for psychological warfare purposes, not only against the domestic population, but also against foreign populations and foreign enemies, foreign governments. Absolutely. You, you, you get thoughts of Project Bluebeam and how maybe this is all military craft and they're, uh, they know exactly what they are uh, and that there's no aliens at all or extraterrestrials or interdimensional beings. And maybe it's all our stuff. But of course, they're going to put it under the guise that it is something mystical that we don't have a handle on. If it was our technology, these are just big what ifs and they splinter off in all directions to the perception management angle of it. It's almost like instead of saying that the emperor wears no clothes, it's like they're saying, well, of course he wears no clothes, but you're a fool for saying that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, well, I don't think, I mean, it's, so people like Mark Pilkington, who wrote Mirage Men, and um, I highly recommend that book and the documentary based on it. It's essential, really, for anyone to read and watch. And Greg Bishop, who wrote um, Project Beta, or Project Beta, as you Americans would say. <laughs> that um, is how we say it. <laughs> Um, are essential reads for anyone who wants to understand the history and the specifics of how um, how UFOs in the popular consciousness, specifically uh, through the actions of government dis disinformation operatives, going back to the 1970s, at well, certainly going back to the 1970s in a documented way. And this, this campaign of disinformation and sowing of a particular narrative, which we can call now the UFO core story, started in the early 1980s in a really concerted way. And a lot of what people came to and now do believe about UFOs and the government's relationship to the phenomenon has been sown actually by the government itself. We believe what they've wanted us to believe. And that raises serious questions. And I... I strongly feel that the idea that the US government has a firm handle on what's going on here, that they are in league with various different extraterrestrial races, they're working with them, it, it, I, it's a myth. It's a complete myth. And it's been spun for purposes of psychological warfare, or multiple purposes, but that's one of them. That's one of the reasons. Now, that's not to say that there aren't non-human beings interacting with us and that the government hasn't had some kind of interaction with them on some level. I'm sure that's probably the case. Um, but the, these ideas of like, you know, <laughs> that we've got treaties with the greys so that they can abduct. Why would we need a treaty with a, with a civilization that's going to be thousands or even millions of years more advanced? How, like, how many treaties do we have with chimps when we, when, them in you know in the jungle and, and take them you know and, and do some kind of um, medical procedure on them for, for their own survival or whatever how many how many treaties do we sign with the chimps it, it's, it's it's unnecessary with it they can do whatever they want to us whenever they want however they want and, and without us even knowing really would yeah, and the Granada Treaty comes to mind. It's the Truman uh, Treaty with him, and they they can all point to well, he was he had missing time here, and that's when that went and happened. And they said they, in exchange for technology, of course, uh, to the guys of that, uh, would take just a few of us, and then surprisingly, they took took a bunch more. We don't know what happened, and then it's kind of the end of the story. It's a silly proposition, and you you make a great. Point. I, I think you know, and again, I can't definitively discount um, that. A president, a past president, or, or, or political leader in in America or, or other countries may have had some kind of um, direct access to, or even face to face communication with some kind of non human entity. It's, it's anything's possible. Literally anything's possible. But there's no there's no strong evidence for for any of that at all. And when you start to apply some basic logic to it, it just makes no sense whatsoever. I think the the more frightening thing. Not that I'm frightened by the phenomenon, but I think the more alarming thing is for people to, to it's almost more comforting to think that the US government does have a really firm handle on this and does have treaties and has successfully reverse engineered the technologies and it has, has got multiple fleets of, you know, flying saucers and here to Zeta Reticuli and whatever, but it, 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 it's, but it goes, <laughs> it's just science fiction. I mean, 
Right. And it is depending on how you feel about the government and how much you trust them to make sure that uh, these type of things are handled properly. Uh, it, I don't know. I, I would think that it'd be better if uh, they had more of a human connection and they left politicians and the military out of it altogether. Well, exactly. This, this is the other thing, right? This is the other thing that the phenomenon, you know, when you talk to someone who's completely uninitiated on UFOs and is generally skeptical, I'll say, well, 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 if they were real, then we would know about it because the government would know about it. And, you know, or the scientists, you know, the scientists will say, well, we would, we would know about it by now because we'd be consulted and it would the phenomenon, if you look at the grassroots reports, you know, from people all around the world, cross cultures, across time, the phenomenon does not operate from a top down level. It operates from a bottom up level across culture and across time at a grassroots level. It, it communicates with people in mysterious ways with very little evidence on an individual basis, typically. Uh, and those experiences that the individual has are told verbally through some form of narrative. And then those stories sort of permeate their local society and, you know, filter into kind of culture and they become part of popular consciousness, albeit not in a way that is um, accepted by consensus reality. So UFOs and aliens are everywhere in our culture everywhere but they're not accepted as 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 being factual or scientific by consensus reality although we're potentially getting to a point where that's not too far off but because that's how the phenomenon operates it doesn't it, it doesn't land on the white house lawn you know it doesn't it doesn't seek a, a meeting with um you know any leader of any particular country because of course any uh it, well, and why would it? Why why would it? I mean, the president's in office for four years, maximum of eight years, and that's comparable around the world. And you know, it's talking about dictators. But even the span of fifty years is nothing in the blink in the blink of an eye. It's just, it's just like a blink of an eye on a universal time scale. And like we say, we're talking about a phenomenon here that's been with us clearly for a very very long time. And and I, I also you know people talk about visitors, and I don't think it's even. Why do we even assume they're visitors? That assumes that why are they visitors? <laughs> do you do it? They could be interterrestrials if you do the hollow earth thing, or they could be interdimensionals and they just shift the frequency and then here they are. Uh, there's quite a few different um, thoughts on that subject, and I would I would like to know your personal opinion on that. What do you What do you think they are? Uh. You don't have to plant your flag. I mean, even just your favorite. Like, I've got a favorite. I don't know if it's the real one, but it's the uh, humans from the future coming back in time machines. That's my favorite. I tell you what, I, I, I in the past, never really gave that much consideration. However, however, uh, I now think it's probably one of the stronger contenders. Uh, yeah, right. For, it makes so much sense. There's been several books written on it. I know Diane Tessman uh, wrote a book on it. Um, Alan Butler wrote a book called Intervention. And then, of course, my, my favorite one, the one that I like the most is uh, Unidentified Flying Objects by uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Michael P. Masters. Have mm -hmm. you seen that or is yep. that the comment on your writer? Because he, he takes just such an um, academic approach to it uh, with his background. And he, he makes the great argument that out of the millions of species that have evolved on Earth, only one of them has been bipedal. And that's what they're reported. If you, if you look at the Nordics and the Greys and all these other types of things. Well, look, I mean, we, uh, from a logical standpoint, okay, so theoretically, backwards time travel is possible. That's the latest, that's the latest research on it, is that theoretically, backwards time travel, if not forwards time travel, is possible, theoretically. Now, we know that we exist. We know that humans exist. Now, we could get into all sorts of discussions existence but let's for now let's just say we know that we we know we exist right for the sake of the argument absolutely but we don't conclusively know that life outside earth exists which is there's a lot of so there's a lot of evidence to suggest that some kind of life that's not human so does exist and that we interact with it pretty regularly but we don't know that it's extraterrestrial so we know that we exist but we don't know that alien life has evolved anywhere outside of Earth yet. Not officially. It almost certainly has. And almost certainly that the, the universe is teeming with life. 
at all different evolutionary stages, but we don't know that for sure. Right. But we know for sure that we exist. Well, kind of. So, so, so with that in mind and with the idea that, th that backwards time travel is theoretically possible, it's actually more logical. Again, when you look at the actual nature of report from experiences and the messages that are received by the experiences that are delivered by these non-human beings, which like you say, some of whom look identical to us virtually, Literally, yeah, or what we would look like if we kept evolving with or, the big heads and the yeah, skinny bones, or even the Nord or, yeah, or, or the Nordics, or the Nordics, right, or whatever, mm -hmm. and they look remarkably like us. Yeah, and, they say they could just walk among us, and we wouldn't know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, so, the message, one of the consistent messages that's been delivered since the 1950s to people who claim to have had contact with these beings, is a message of concern about the future of humanity and about the <clears throat> about our ecology our environment our nuclear weapons what we're doing to our planet the future of our species the survival of our species they state this explicitly and they're obviously very concerned with our dna as well now at least this is what's reported no so why would an extraterrestrial species presumably evolved on a planet, God knows how many, you know, dis distances we can't even imagine. Why would they have any interest in the future of a very primitive monkey-like species on a very average planet in, in the Milky Way? It, does, it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, it's hugely egoic to think that, that any species would 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 put that much time and effort into us if we're not even related to them. Of course, people might say, "Oh, we are related to them because they seeded us." It's one argument, but it, the the over vested interest in the reports is anomalous. I mean, it's 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 fascinating how that is just so prevalent in all the reports of anywhere on Earth throughout time since they've been collecting reports. Is right. How interested they are. Right. And you're yeah. absolutely right. And of course, so so the question is, we couldn't really say exactly why uh, an alien civilization might be interested in the future of us, uh, but we can say, well, it would make a lot of sense that we humans would be very concerned about ourselves in the future at the point where we've developed time travel and we think, God, we've really fucked up the world. <laughs> and maybe we can, maybe we can go back and make a few changes so that, uh, so, that, so that it's not so fucked up. Yeah. I love it. I mean, the more, and I've never heard it put the way you put it, but now I'm even more sold. It, it jumped up another notch on my most probable list. If I had to plant my flag anywhere, it would be on that. No, I which is fun to think about. I wouldn't even say that, you know, that's, I'm not a one theory kind of guy when it comes to UFOs, it's clearly a, a, a multifaceted phenomenon. And I, you know, extraterrestrials may very well be involved. I would say probably are on some level involved. I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to, to, to bet on any particular theory. I would, I would bet confidently that we're talking about uh, multiple phenomena sometimes coalescing and also the thing that works that, that's always overlooked is the role of the perceiver the experiencer in creating the experience because we we do ourselves a disservice by taking out of the equation the power of our own consciousness which we barely even understand what do we bring to this to what extent do we shape these experiences the closer the object, the closer the UFO or the being or whatever it is, however it manifests, manifests in all sorts of different ways across time and culture, the closer it is in physical danger the event becomes. And it seems that the, the greater the role of the perceiver in shaping the experience. Yes. That is one of the most phenomenal things about it is how different they are, but how similar they are in the fact that they're so wide. They're, they're wild. There they're is clearly, huge. yeah. Yeah. Not, that's not to suggest that people are just, you know, that because it's clearly a, a common thread and there's clearly some very strong commonalities to these reports and they're manifesting in certain ways. But at the same time, like Jacques Vallée and others have, have asked, are we, you know, is it the collective unconscious um, interpreting a, incomprehensible phenomenon through the cultural framework of the time. 
it has to be it has to be you know it's a valid question maybe it's an essential question but it's it's very hard to get your head around and i think that's why people just people prefer simplistic answers uh, to terrestrials traveling here in nuts and bolts spacecraft to experiment on us uh is and you know the government knows about it. The government has all the secrets. It's keeping it keeping a lid on them. And at some point, we'll have full disclosure. We'll have a utopia when the government announces the reality of the phenomenon. And everyone will have free energy technology, and we'll be living in, you know, Stephen Bassett's um, utopia. It's a fantasy because it's far more complicated than that. The reality is is that we, I honestly believe, don't have the capacity at this stage of our of our evolution to understand the magnitude of of this phenomenon which encompasses multiple phenomena i completely agree i think that is the most logical thing you can think of uh, that is the most logical uh, pin you can put on it there's there's no way it's just if i had to pick like a personal favorite it's the thought experiment of uh, surviving whatever cataclysms come across i mean the odds of an asteroid striking us and killing us um the odds of us destroying ourselves are far far more likely uh and us surviving to the point where we can create technologies like that and then come back to visit the past which and a lot of those times, like you said, because they're so interested in the DNA, they're interested in the preservation of the planet, that it may be something that eventually it's their last throws. It's humanity's last throws at its chance to save itself. And it needs to do that through DNA at some level. I mean, these are just the, the things people talk. Yeah, about. I mean, I think it's certainly as valid as any other ufological theory, uh, but it's definitely been overlooked. And um, uh, but I think it's there's all sorts of, of different theories that should be considered. I completely agree. And I thank you for going down that rabbit hole with me, man. That was incredibly succinct. And I appreciate <laughs> appreciate you doing that. I actually had some more questions on your work. I uh, you, Do you mind if we switch back to that for a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to know about um, that uh, documentary, uh, The Past, Present, and Future, uh, that you talked about, uh, the 1974 UFOs, Past, Present, and Future, uh, Robert Eminger. Emenegger, yeah. Emenegger, okay. Um, so what role did that play? Uh, what was the significance of that film? It's very, very interesting uh, production. This was, so Robert Emenegger, for those of you who've seen the TV show Mad Men, um, about the advertising industry in the 1950s. Great show. Yeah, great show. Um, Robert Emenegger was sort of like the real life Don Draper. He was a uh, creative director of Grey Advertising, which is one of the largest uh, advertising companies in America at the time, based in New York. And he was approached in the early 1970s with his production partner, Alan Sandler, who was a CIA-connected guy. And this, the Air Force wanted to have these guys make a documentary about UFOs. Now, this was only just a few years after the Project Blue Book. So Blue Book closed in 1969. I think this, this production started to get rolling in about 1970. So really, the Air Force should have been, you know, completely silent on the issue. But obviously, they'd started to what this plays into what I was saying earlier about how, although they recognized that they needed to continue a, a campaign of perception management. And so... Typically, they do this by approaching people who they feel they can trust within an entertainment industry, people who might be favorable or sympathetic with. And obviously, Emenegger's production partner, Alan Sandler, was for all in a asset. And this production got brought to Emenegger as director. And they said, look, yeah, we want to give you unprecedented access for military sites in the US. And we want to give you sort of on-camera interviews with the project, heads of Project Blue Book and various various generals and colonels who will talk to you about UFOs in an open-minded way. And this, so this was an F, this was a project that was instigated by the U.S. government, but more specifically by probably by the CIA. We also that as well because Emmanuel said that throughout the production process. He was shadowed, in his words, by a guy called Dick Besky. You can look him up. He's a retired CIA operative, or was. And um, he, uh, 
and he was he was basically tasked by the CIA to, to follow them around throughout the throughout the shoot. And they were briefed on the project, according to Fuminaga, in a CIA clean room at Norton Air Force Base, so that no one could hear them. It was like so they couldn't be bugged, and there was no no chance of anyone else getting wind of what was being discussed because it was a very sensitive topic. So Emenegger went to this as a skeptic or, or having no interest really in UFOs at all. And he said that quite rapidly as people started to talk to him within the military, he was shown photographs and footage and documents. Uh, he was, he, he started to recognize that obviously the military takes it <clears throat> very seriously and there seems to be something to it. And, uh, was promised access to footage of an alien landing, alien spacecraft landing at Holloman Air Force Base in, well, the, the year was never really specified. The, the, the year is unclear, to be honest with you. There's, multiple, there's different accounts as to when the footage was actually shot. It was supposedly shot at Holloman Air Force Base. And, um, Maybe the John Glenn footage that he talked about sending off. Oh, you mean uh, Gordon Cooper? Oh, Gordon Cooper. My bad. Yeah. Yeah. Gordon Cooper. Yeah. Well, that was, I think he was talking at Edwards Air Force Base. So that was a different incident. He, it, that was a, it, so, I mean, it makes you wonder how many, you know, and obviously that's a credible report by Gordon Cooper. I mean, there's no reason to doubt, to doubt that at all. It makes you wonder how many incidents there have been of unknown objects just randomly touching down at a class of, you know, highly, highly sensitive military uh, bases. And so, so it, it's certainly, not out of the realms of this, you know, there could have been some truth to, to what Amanega was being told and um, told by his contacts in the military who were working on the production in an official capacity, by the way, they were in an official capacity. This, this project was signed off on and authorized by the then secretary of the air force. I document all of this in my um, silver screen sources book in quite some detail. And I interview Amanega at length and, um, yeah, they were told that the footage showed an object, a UFO, a flying saucer, essentially landing, touching down uh, on the ground in broad daylight at Holloman Air Force Base and military personnel going out in jeeps, driving up quite close to it. And then beings, non-human beings, exiting the object and approaching and having some kind of dialogue with the military people and the beings were described as humanoid, quite human like, um, with large kind of sort of protuberances on their noses. It could have been like a head that, and also it could have been part of the head headgear that they're wearing. It's almost like described as like a rope, like headdress kind of thing that they were wearing. Um, strange eyes, like basically not like aliens, not like any kind of description of aliens that I've ever read before or since really. And, um, that was basically it that the, that the, oh, and that the aliens then joined the military personnel and retired with them into some kind of, um, you know, uh, some part of the, some part of Holloman Air Force Base. And the footage apparently depicted all of this. So Emenega was like, well, that's really hard to believe. And I'm not really sure I do believe that, but you've promised me the footage and you've said that I can use it in my documentary. So I'm looking forward to having it. They strung him along for a long time, months and months and months. And um, every time he thought he was going to get the footage, they said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't give it to you at this moment because it's too sensitive. This was the time where Watergate was starting to break. By the time the movie was, was probably the time the documentary was actually ready to be screened and and, uh, and was finished in, in the editing process, it was around like 1973 or 1974, 1974, I think. And uh, they said the climate wasn't right to drop this extraterrestrial bomb on the public um, because the country was already in too much turmoil you know Vietnam and everything and so they that that was their reasons officially as, as described by Emenegger and they, they and but they did say look you can still have all of the foot all of the footage that you filmed with us you will you can have all the footage that you've shot with the heads of project blue book and and it was you know, he, he had access to, to multiple Air Force bases, uh, multiple really high-ranking military uh, military personnel talking quite explicitly about UFOs in a very open-minded way. And all the bases that he had access to had some UFO background to them, or they suspected. So, 
Yeah, so they said that although he couldn't have the actual alien landing footage, if it ever existed in the first place, what he could have was a few frames of it. And during the editing stage, they said, look, you can have this little bit here. And they gave him literally just a few frames, like a few seconds worth of footage, colour footage of a what looks like a self-luminescent orb, uh, quite bright orb, descending across against the back drop the uh, the mountainous backdrop of Holloman Air Force Base or well we don't know it's Holloman Air Force Base it could be any Air Force um, but it does look like some kind of base and you can see a self-luminescent object descending and it does appear to be I mean I, I it's unidentified it's a, it's a UFI whatever it is it's some kind of unidentified flying object descending in apparently a controlled manner <clears throat> towards the ground and they said that this was just a few frames of the footage um, presumably before it landed, if if indeed there's any truth to the rest of that story, which we just don't know. Because again, you have to look at what what's the agenda here? Why did they do that? Why did they even give them access to, to, to all of this information? Why did they why did the Air Force actively encourage and the CIA actively encourage? It wasn't just the Air Force or the CIA. It was every virtually every branch of the US military was involved in this production. And it was signed off on by the by the um by the Secretary of the Air Force, and apparently, I think, according to Emenegger, if I'm recalling this correctly, even went up to Nixon himself at the time. So what was the agenda here after they've just recently closed down Blue Book? Why now are they wanting people to actively believe in, in the phenomenon? And But it's not just that they want people to believe, it's what do they want them to believe? And clearly, they wanted them to believe that they've had face-to-face, meaningful, diplomatic relations now what kind of a message do you think that is going to send out to the soviet union china other potential enemies who have been studying the phenomenon for just as long as they have and recognize that it's real but don't fully understand it all of a sudden you know the soviets they have access to that documentary and they're, they're watching that thinking holy shit the americans they've got they've they're in they're, they're, they've got diplomatic relations with them yeah, forget about mutually assured destruction. That that'd be it. It's it's superiority right? at that point. Yeah, right. This is psychological warfare, and this continued. And this is, not, and I'm not saying that based on this one case. This is this is a thread that's very clear through multiple cases of of, of uh, government interaction with people in the in in the entertainment industry and within ufology, going right throughout the 90, 80s and beyond, um, even up to present day. And the message has been consistent. In, in any production that's been backed by the Department of Defense when it comes to UFOs. And the message has been, we have hands-on access to this technology. We understand it. We've reverse engineered it. And we have a really good handle on it. You know, and, and that idea then filters into popular consciousness and it certainly filters overseas as well. Uh, so, you know, it, it's uh, beyond that. We can't, it, it's so much is unknown. Most of it's unknown. But what we can say is, really as it appears with with ufos you you can and so what do you think though the next step for disclosure is going to be as far not not the truth what do you think how do you think that they're going to leverage it i don't like the term disclosure i i, I think disclosure so disclosure is 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 first like people no no one really even talked about disclosure i started using it in around 2001 with the national press club conference that really really changed the face of, of UFO, of, uf, of ufology and the UFO subculture forever. That had immense impact. That that conference that he that he um, that he held in, in May of two thousand and one, May 9th, which is actually my birthday. Happy birthday! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that was uh, May 9th, two thousand and one, um, and yeah, that just had enormous enormous impact and then virtually overnight disclosure also this this don't forget Greer's National Press Club conference there in 2001 that came at a time where the internet was just starting to explode so everyone saw everyone could see that you didn't have to watch that on a VHS and buy it at a UFO conference it was on the internet everyone saw it straight away and this, it was unprecedented no one had seen anything like that before and it opened up that kind of testimony to everyone 
And all of a sudden, everyone's like, oh, my God. And that was their first introduction. For many people, that was their first introduction to the UFO subject. They didn't really have much interest or knowledge of the history of the decades of history that had gone before it. And, and suddenly, everything was about disclosure. And disclosure suddenly seemed imminent. And it was just reach. If only we can, t- if only more press conferences could be held and if petitions could be signed, et cetera, et cetera. Power of the right? people. Power, exactly, that's it, and others then got on board and became huge advocates of this and, and created essentially the disclosure movement as we know it to, as we know it today. The disclosure movement didn't exist before 2001. Well, you could argue that people like Donald Ke- Donald Kehoe in 1950 was the first sort of Stephen Greer. He was advocating for, for an end to government UFO secrecy in the 1950s, but it, it didn't have the momentum that, that uh, Greer created in, in the early 2000s. But the problem is, is if what Greer did there is, and I'm, I'm not, and I'm not getting down on 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 that conference. I think it's it was important, um, but at the same time, uh, what it served to do was massively simplify the UFO issue in the public in the public mind, and reduced it down to an, to a political issue. First of all, it reduced it down to something to do with politics and um, and, a, and the promise of an imminent disclosure that could change the world forever. That is a huge injustice to the complexities and subtleties of the phenomenon. It's just another distractive tool. It's just another way of looking at it in a way that's disingenuous. Yeah, and, and of course, I, I, I understand the appeal of it as well. And, and I bought into it. I bought into that for a long yep. time, yeah. you know? Um, it, it's, it's, it's very attractive, the idea that... Um, that the truth is something that can be, first of all, defined, <laughs> second of all, underst- understood, and, and, and then is available to us all in a way that we can, in a way that actually affects our lives in a positive way, and that we can take it if we, if we, if we take the right steps in our lifetimes and it can happen next year etc which is why you know people like steve bassett continually consistently say this is the year of disclosure this is the year of disclosure this is the year of disclosure i've been saying it for the past 20 years but this is the year of disclosure exactly and it's become the new thing like the you know jesus is going to come back in my lifetime well my great-grandparents said that my grandparents said that they've all dead and gone and you know maybe Get but it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah, we get into the religiosity of the of of UFOs then, and the yep. idea that it's a new, a new age religion, which it is. It, you, you know, ufology is a new age religion. It is something that that Diana Pasolko has explored in her book American Cosmic, and um, you know, and, other, and others before her. And it is definitely a, a new age religion. But people get very annoyed when you say that because they they think that you're dismissing the subject as. There's fantasy. Well, that's not the case at all. It's it's the problem. The, the conundrum comes because we're dealing with a real phenomenon that has tangible effects on human beings, and in some cases, is you know there's some physical proof for its interactions with us as well. In 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 in, in certain cases, in many cases, in fact, albeit not conclusive proof. Um, it's an elusive phenomenon, but it's real, whatever the hell it is. But because it's so elusive and seemingly intangible in many ways, it lends itself or in fact demands belief. You can't talk about UFOs with belief. People say, oh, I don't need to believe. And I, and I've said many times, you don't need to believe in UFOs. I even wrote an article called, you don't need to, to believe in UFOs because you know, talking about the evidence to, to show that they're real. But at the same time, you always, there is always some level in UFOs because all we know is that there is a phenomenon that interacts with us. Maybe it's part of us, whatever the hell it is that it has effects that seems to manifest in certain ways at certain times. Uh, beyond that, we really don't know. We don't have any conclusive answers. We don't have any solid answers. And so in the absence of, of clearly defined answers, well, what do we have? We have belief. <clears throat> and so that's why <clears throat> there's all sorts of different types of beliefs surrounding UFOs. <laughs> They're time travelers. They're uh, multidimensional entities that can manifest as fairies and goblins and incubi and succubi and whatever. There's all sorts of different beliefs because we don't have, we don't, we don't know, we don't know. And so there's always belief. Even and it, and then there's you know even skepticism calls on belief as well. 
I, I don't believe they're this, I don't believe they're that. But yeah, they don't know. They don't know, but they, they believe. So it's a, it's a phenomenon that demands belief and it invites it and demands it. So it's tricky. And I think of the Chris Rock line in the movie Dogma. Do you ever see that movie? Mm-hmm. Okay. Whenever he says, you know, I have ideas, not beliefs, because beliefs yeah. are harder to change. And that's exactly how I feel about it. I have, if I want to go down the rabbit hole of perspective, Uh, preference you know or what I think is most whimsical or fun we can do that but never will I ever say yep this is what it is because that's a strong firm held belief and if anything the phenomena has taught us that it will change your mind about it instantly Mm -hmm. yeah yeah well I wish that was the case I mean I think a lot of people's minds are very hard to change in my opinion I agree and then there's battle within the within the community I mean it's all sorts of drama wrapped up into it and it's it's insane and unnecessary and it actually I think only puts people further back instead of going oh that's a cool idea yeah that's very interesting or wow did you hear about this experience that's totally counterintuitive to what I've been hearing about these other people saying and then they do get in these camps and it's it's unfortunate because it's a real cool thing to examine absolutely and um you know that i think that that's just reminding me of going back to that um rabbit hole discussion we were having about what the hell are these things um you know i think more focus needs to be yeah the, the one of the, the fundamental problems i think is there's an assumption <clears throat> i think it's a natural human assumption that the phenomenon let's call it the phenomenon because that's basically how people i mean that's how james fox has yep. coined it now oh, well, he's adopted that from yeah and um, I, I was going to say I, I wrote a review of that for um daily grail um oh, a few months back now and and it's um i have to say i i, I thoroughly enjoyed the film i thought it was i thought it was excellent certainly by far the best uh, ufo documentary made at this point but i was i was i was also at the same time sort of critical not of the film but of the fact that it sort of didn't go far enough i'd have liked to have seen it gone gone further i understand he's, he's trying to make a film that's got mass appeal and if you start to go too deep down the rabbit hole it, it loses credibility for people who are not really sort of well versed on this and i completely understand his approach and i think he was completely successful in what he set out to do um and i think it's had a big impact or will have a lasting impact that documentary but I, I think f- from my perspective i'd have liked to have seen him gone into gone into exploring the more high strangeness aspects of ufos which really are, are the most important aspects of it the, the the absurd aspects of ufos in close encounters which a lot of people self-censor in their own reports because they think well if i report this part of it no one's going to believe it it did happen but i'm not going to say it because it just sounds too mental <laughs> but i think those are the those are the those are the parts of the phenomenon that we really should be studying uh so well what i what i think is interesting about it and i completely agree with you that those are the parts of it that do need to be studied and jacques Vallée was a big component of this proponent of this as well uh is you know i think james fox has a real opportunity here with the cult following that he's gotten with the attention that he's gotten on that bit of it if he expands further i mean he's really got an opportunity with the attention that's surrounding this and with already the clout of that being one of the best ufo documentaries now he can really dive into with a greater broader audience's attention and maybe that that's uh, hopefully his next step. It may well be because, <clears throat> of course, you know, you know, James Fox, he, he has a far better understanding of the phenomenon, far more nuanced understanding of the phenomenon than is than comes across in, in, excuse me, but he's he's making it for a particular audience um, to to really sort of raise general awareness of, of the significance of what's of, you know, of the phenomenon. And it's I just thought it was ironic, of course, that Jacques Vallée was such a, a central part of that documentary and and many of his more <clears throat> interesting theories are, are never explored um they're omitted quite deliberately because again to get into that would almost derail the derail that film for many people because it'd be like this is just crazy you had me okay i can i can understand the military might be interested there's national security implications when you you know really crazy parts of of these reports especially when you're talking about <laughs> Uh, multi, the multi-phenomenal aspect of UFOs. So many UFO experiences, in fact, I would say most UFO experiences who have close-up interactions or who report close-up interactions with UFOs and non-human beings typically also report experiences with other types of phenomena as well, poltergeist phenomena, other types of supernatural or paranormal phenomena. Uh, even, right, I'm talking like Bigfoot. Now, you can throw it all out and ignore it, but the fact is that the reports are so consistent 
you, you can't be that selective. You have to listen to what people are saying. And this is what people are reporting. You can't just get to say, oh, I'm going to believe the part where he's reporting the UFO, but I'm going to not, I don't, can't really believe that he's seen a Bigfoot as well with the UFO. That's just ridiculous. You can't choose what to, you have to take it all in and, and, and try to make some assessment of it. And clearly these phenomena are, are related it's, it's got like a super friends aspect of it. Superman may be your favorite, but Batman and Wonder Woman are in there too. <laughs> yeah, I like it, yeah. It, it's interesting, and I, I agree with you on that. I think that he did do it right, and he played it right. Now, the, the true brilliance of it would be if uh, he took more of uh, the Jacques Vallée angle and really incorporated some of the more high strangeness aspects. That's just a common term used. Uh, and did another several films, man, and, and maybe really focused on that. You know, there's a, a friend of mine, um, I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to talk about it, to be honest, but there's a, a friend of mine um, uh, is making a documentary, a, a three-part series right now. In fact, it's in the editing process, um, interviewing some really fantastic people. And um, it uh, promises to be certainly one of the most insightful and challenging, I think, uh, factual programs, factual products on, on UFOs, maybe ever. And um, that may very well come out sometime later this year. So, um, I, and you'll know about it when it comes out. It, you, there'll be no missing it. But yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, he, he's going to, I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be quite a big one. So I'm looking forward to it. But yeah, certainly I, I think that there are products in the works where people are you know, asking those really challenging questions about, about UFOs. I think it's the time that they should be. I think that we're now so exposed to the idea. I think more people, like you said, have come around to this idea and we don't need the government to tell us if it's real or not, because clearly it is. It's something's going on. And I think these independent filmmakers are taking it upon themselves to kind of explain things a little bit better and to pull pull the material, rather with the consent of the DOD or not. I, I think it's brilliant. And I think that there's a lot more attention paid to that than the naysayers and the poo-pooers. Mm. I was going to say, um, I've, I re realize I sidestepped your question about what's happening with disclosure now. Um, and disclosure, and I, I just throw around as a term that's common. I don't I don't think that we're going to get any straight answer from the government. Anything we do get from them, I think, needs to be taken with a big old grain of salt. And we really need to look deeper into what they're telling us, because that's probably not all there is to it. It's a steered narrative either way. It is. Um I wish we would take it with a grain of salt, but the, we're not. I mean, we might. It, but, we will, but it's too big. <laughs> it's too big. But most for people most won't. People. Right. Um, and this is my concern. So I'm not, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a whole new generation of younger. It was not so long ago that I was the younger generation of you. I was one of the new kids on the block. I feel I feel old now, and um, there is a, a whole new generation of people very interested in UFOs who have <clears throat> emerged really quite suddenly in post the 2017 DoD sort of revelations in the New York Times article of 2017, which revealed that the DoD was studying UFOs and call them, calling them UAPs. That you know they're reactive. By the way. The fact that they're calling them UAPs now, and that, that's not a thing. I mean, the, the, the UK government um, and the US government have, have referred to them as UAPs <clears throat> in private documents for, for many years. In fact, the, the uh, UK government, the, uh, in, uh, the, uh, I forgot what the hell they called, um, Defence Intelligence Staff produced a, uh, <clears throat> a large document maybe 20 years ago now, the Condine report, which in which they concluded that um, the phenomenon is real, but misunderstood, but you know, not, not currently fully understood by science. And it potentially could pose some defense risks um, for aircraft, you know, while it's not actively hostile, that it seems to, you know, it could potentially be exploited for technological, you know, we could sort of try to mimic some of how it, how it works or behaves. It was a pretty amazing, one of the most amazing UFO documents ever. Um, and it was secret at the time, but it was eventually declassified, the Condine Report. Um, and they refer to them throughout as, as UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena. But the, the rebranding of UFOs to UAPs is a very conscious thing. Yeah, so it's not really searchable in um, the uh, Freedom of Information Act requests, right? Well, I think it's more than that. 
you know, I, I mean, I, I personally, you get, you're going to get me going down the route now. I like rabbit holes, man. Go for <laughs> it. You're, you're great to talk to. So we could do this forever, man. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I've really, we're still too close to, to the 2017 thing, really. That, there's no question about it that in 2017, with the publication of that New York Times article by Leslie Keenan and the media coverage that, that ensued, and in conjunction with Tom DeLonge's To the Stars and everything that went along with that, the landscape of ufology, UFO subculture, and officialdom's relationship to the public on the subject changed completely. And I've not seen anything like that. I've I've been following UFOs, following UFOs. I've been uh, I've been <laughs> I've been obsessed with UFOs, shall we say, since I was since I was fourteen uh, for 25, 25 years. We can say obsessed because I wear that hat with you, my friend. I get it. Well, it's uh, like it invites belief. It also invites obsession. There's no question. About Absolutely, it. it's so um, elusive. You have to. Mm-hmm. And um, so, you know, I, I followed this for for. More, you know, a long time, many, many years. I'm 39 now and I've been following it since I was like 14 years old. And I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime of this significance where, the, you know, typically, okay, so officialdom's historical relationship to the public in regards to UFOs up until, well, well, up until today, really, but historically, when you look back, officialdom's historical relationship to the public in regards to UFOs has been characterized exclusive deception, dis- disinformation and manipulation towards agendas unknown. That we can say conclusively, right? <laughs> Beginning right with, with where it was, you know, they, they announced a flying saucer, then it was a weather balloon, then it was a mobile balloon. You know, the, the official Roswell story has been rewritten four times, now, uh, you know, by the US Air Force. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't claim to know what the hell actually happened to Roswell. I, 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 I'm sure it's even far. I'm sure it, it may not even be anything that anyone's conceived of. Maybe it was time travel. Who the hell knows? Maybe it was none of those things. Maybe, as some people suggest, it was all a psychological warfare campaign. I wouldn't even I wouldn't even rule that out. Point is, is, is that. Um, when it comes, regardless of the origin of of, of of some of these reports and, and so-called crashes, etc., the the narratives that have been spun have been deceptive, and they've been spun by the U.S. government itself or other 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 governments. But we're talking here about the American government. <laughs> um, so, if you've had seventy years of non-stop deception, manipulation, disinformation on the UFO subject from the corridors of power. Why in suddenly in 2017, does the government decide to become a benevolent, altruistic, open and transparent entity and think, you know what, let's just tell everyone the truth. Yeah. Give everything to everybody and let's just get this all out in the open and we can all have a, no, you really think that any of this is being done for your good? I'm talking to some of the people who are listening here. Like none of this is in service of you. They don't give a shit about you. I'm really sorry to say it. Preach, Robbie. Think, right? Preach. <laughs> they do not give a shit. They are self-serving. They have their own multiple agendas, none of which I would even, I mean, we could attempt to guess at, but certainly are beyond my knowledge and certainly beyond yours. And being given the truth here, you're sorely mistaken and you need to do serious historical research. And, um, these people, uh, uh, fuck it. Uh, these people are not your friends. These people, these who you work, Lou Elizondo, these guys, these are not your friends. No. Right. It's the Carlin thing. It's a big club and you're not in it. And, um, you've been suckered. Anyone who believes this, anyone who believes that this stuff is, is, you know, that, that there is a, a disclosure plan underway whereby, look, I, I what concerns me clearly towards something here, some th- something is, th- th- there have been some decisions that have been made in the past few years and there's been a shift behind the scenes. Um, do you honestly believe the Department of Defense, the CIA, these agencies who have a fucking awful history? I mean, monster, I know that's not to, I'm, 
please don't misunderstand me. I'm not tarring all of the people who work for all these organizations with the same brush. I'm not, I'm talking about an institutional high top down level. I'm not talking about, you know, people who there's many great DOD, et cetera. No question, no question. But I'm saying that historically, if you look at the actions of these agencies and these organizations throughout history, they've not been a force for good. They've been a force for total fucking destruction globally. And, and if you think that, that they have the interests of the American public or the public at large worldwide at heart on this subject or any sub or, or any issue, you, you're, you're mistaken because ultimately these agencies and these organizations are self-serving and they serve the few, they serve the elite and, um, and you're just pawns and, uh, and this is the way it, I've got. I've really fucking gone down Fox Mulder territory here. <laughs> I love it. I really, I love I've really it. gone to. I've really gone to town. But <laughs> you know, who cares? I mean, come on, people, come on. Um, look, and I'm not saying. This, but I'm not. I'm not saying as well. You people like David Fravor and the, and the pilots and stuff. Clearly, they're clearly they're telling the truth. There's no question about it. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but it's more complicated than that. Definitely, it right? always is. It's more complicated than that. You have to, it, it's not about what they're saying and what it's about why. Mm-hmm. Why? Why now? How is it being presented? Who's presenting it? What's the common thread? What's the, what's the core theme, the message? Well, disturbingly and as ever, it's being couched in the language of national security and threat. And um, it, it concerns me, I've got to tell you, it concerns me. And it concerns me how, how willingly this new generation of, of people in, in the UFO research field are just completely, almost like worshipping some of these figures, like you know, Tom DeLong and, and some of these people who, who are worshipping them as like demigods. Um, and Tom DeLong was suckered as well. I wrote an article. Uh, I, I believe Tom DeLong is, 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 is genuine in, in, you know, in his his beliefs and his, and his, his message. I, I, you know, I think he's, he's, he's genuine, you know, um, but he's, he's, he's a pawn, one in a long line of people who have been manipulated and whose egos have got special books that have been given information, but it's not, it, it's dis, it's not info, it's, it's disinformation. You honestly believe that the, you, the, the secrets of the universe are going to be told to Tom DeLong? Yeah, good call. Yeah. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. I love it. Yeah. No, I'm with you. I'm completely with you. I love this. All right, listen, anyone, I would encourage people to look up <laughs> the DeLong delusion. It's a two-part article that I wrote for Mysterious Universe a few years back. The DeLong delusion. And I go in great detail outlining you know, my argument here, uh, and I put, I put all of this in the context of, of history, of ufological history, and I provide solid examples going back to the early 1980s of where disinformation operatives have suckered people in the UFO community into believing certain things for certain reasons. And a lot of it has to do with psychological warfare. Uh, so I, I love the rabbit hole you went down. So my thought on it is whenever you whenever you ask the question why, and it scares the shit out of me as well, would be uh, the stripping of more of our rights. And um, that's usually where these things end up. Is this march mm-hmm. towards totalitarianism? And maybe it's just another tool in the box. Because mm-hmm. wasn't that a thing that Werner von Braun said on his deathbed, allegedly, uh, if you believe the story, that uh, there were oh, really? a few different threats uh, that were gonna they were going to try and use? I know... Uh, Terrorism was one of them, an asteroid was another, and a fake mm-hmm. alien threat, which is where kind of the Project Bluebeam stuff with Sergei Manas ties in. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, Carol Rosin, who was one of Stephen Greer's Disclosure Project witnesses in 2001, she recounted that story as told to her by Von Braun in the 70s. And um, I've spoken with Carol on a few occasions. And... Um, I can completely believe that he said that. I can, I can believe that. I, I can believe that. I, I really can. It doesn't seem implausible to me. Yeah, it just seems like another tool in the box. I mean, another mm-hmm. another mechanism in which they'll they'll use because they really got to up the ante. Because I mean, and it's not even that hard to believe when 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 you just. I mean, the president said it. You know, Ronald Reagan. What what, what we need is an outside universal threat to bring us together to make us recognize this universal. But you know, Clinton said it as well in reference to Independence Day. Quite honestly, yeah. the movie. Uh-huh. You know, 
So, yeah, I remember that. That speech from Reagan at the, um, what was that, the UN? The, mm-hmm, 1987 mm-hmm. UN. Yeah. And, um, yeah, you know, so it's it's very conspiratorial dark stuff and um and i wouldn't you know plant my flag in that you have to start asking some serious questions look if what we can say is that when it comes to officialdom's relationship to us as regards ufos been characterized by deception manipulation disinformation that has not suddenly changed in 20 just keep that in mind Yep, absolutely. I completely agree. Completely agree, my friend. Well, this is awesome. Uh, this definitely didn't take the turn that I thought it would, but I'm grateful that it did. I'll be honest with you. I, I love this. You're one of my favorite people to talk to on the planet, man. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks so much, Brandon. We didn't even get to the Disney, Jerry Bruckheimer and stuff. It just sounds like <laughs> sounds like we're going to have to do this again soon. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. I didn't mean to get y'all ramped up. It's late over there and, and you're trying to wind down and we got y'all fired up here. No, it's cool. It's cool. Well, I've been, I've been sitting on that for a while. So, <laughs> well, it needed to, it needed to come out. It was brilliantly said, and I don't disagree with anything that you're saying. And I think it's a very enlightening way of putting it. And you're very succinct and eloquent in the way that you put it, which made the delivery even better, my friend. So, thank you. Oh, well, thanks, Brandon. Absolutely. Well, uh, to that point, then we're we're at about the agreed upon time here. So I'm gonna let you run, man. And we'll, uh, like I said, just hopefully do this uh, again here in the future and come back on, man, anytime. You're welcome back anytime. Sounds good. All right. Thank, big thanks to Robbie Graham. Thank you, guys. Y'all be good to each other out there, all right? All right.